Okay. Beg your pardon. Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this morning, or this Thursday morning presentation. Um, and thanks for making the time. Thanks also to Hilke Gelsma for pitching us a talk on Zimbabwe. Just, just by way of a quick um, profile of, of Hilke, he's, a, he's currently a principal ge geoscientist at Anglo American. He holds a PhD in geology from, from the Netherlands and has, has had plus 30 years of work experience in academia and the mining industry. He, he was first a lecturer in geosciences um, at universities in Zimbabwe and South Africa, then as a geological, geological consultant, as a researcher with Martin De Witt Center for Interactive Graphical Computing of Earth Systems in Cape Town. Um, it was, and it's interesting, we had a, a, a talk by another student of Martin's last week, which was really good. Uh, then in 2003, Hilke joined De Beers and a decade, decade later, Anglo-American. His interests, in addition to exploration project generation, include regional geology and tectonics, lithosphere geodynamics and metallogenesis, the topics, of which he, topics on which he has published over 60 papers in peer-reviewed international journals. And we really look forward this morning to Hilke talking about Zimbabwe um, and, and particularly the Kraton, which is very topical these days. There's a lot of activity going on in Zimbabwe. So thanks, Hilke, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks. Thanks very much, John. Um, yeah, good morning, all. And, and, and thanks, John and, and Henny, for the, uh, for the insight. Um, this has been an interesting journey. Um, I mean, in, in 2019, two years ago nearly, um, I was invited by the uh, Geological Society of, of Zimbabwe uh, to present the 11th um, McGregor Memorial Lecture Series in, in Zim. Um, and that invitation really provided me with the, the, the needed incentive to pick up on the research uh, that we conducted pretty much between 97 and 2000, but never really published. So I went on a journey back in time, really, with um, Bob Nesbitt uh, and, and Mark Fenning, here shown on the, uh, on the left, who've been very supportive. Um, and two of the, the original collaborators, Mike uh, Finneu here in the, uh, in the middle, uh, and, and Jim Wilson, uh, also next to him in his younger years. They, they unfortunately since passed away, Mike in, in 2000 and, and Jim in, in 2016. So now almost, Probably um, yeah, two years later, after, after that uh, McGregor series, the related manuscript is about to be uh, published in the, uh, in the forthcoming issue of, of South African Journal of Geology. Um, so which basically honors the, the contributions of Carl Anhoyser, shown here on the right. It's a picture actually taken 50 years ago in 1970 by Bob Nesbitt on the left in the Barberton Belt. So quite befitting, and I will get back to that um, shortly. The, the upcoming manuscript uh, contains unpublished uh, original data from the seminal paper by, by Jim Wilson uh, et al. And also from the subsequent research that we conducted pretty much between 97 and, and um, 2000. So going to the next slide, let's see how that goes. Yeah. Um, this is a picture courtesy of Tim Broderick um, and it shows McGregor um, in the center, in the front row in the center, sitting there surrounded by geological survey staff. It's from 1948. And it's quite a remarkable picture. He was at that time in, in, um, in 1948, he was, he was a director um, and included in this picture are four subsequent directors. You can see there obviously McGregor and he was involved in the first of all, the first edition of the geological map of Zimbabwe in 1921 with Wolf. And then in um, 1946 with the, the fourth edition, but you can also see here Ferguson, you can see here M, you can see there in the, on the upper right, you can see Wiles, and on the left, you can see Stegman. Uh, these are all future directors um, and all responsible, or three of them responsible for subsequent additions to the one in a million 
uh, geological map. Also shown here is, is Worst, uh, who was basically, who mapped the, uh, the Great Dyke, and you can see Lamont, any of you will be familiar with. And you can also see Tyndale Bisco, who was actually responsible for also mapping a large number of geological maps uh, and bulletins. McGregor himself, he produced 15 um, geological maps and, and, and short reports. Um, and he really changed the course of, of geological thinking in Southern Africa at the time. Um, 1946 edition of the, uh, of the geological map, it used his tripartite subdivision of the greenstone belt uh, stratigraphy into the Subacrian, the Bulawai, and, and the, uh, the Shamfayan. It's still a broad framework, which is still broadly uh, accepted. And he had a wide range of, of other interests, pretty much like, like Alex Dutoy, with whom he corresponded much at the time, including on the, uh, on the Karoo and the Kalahari, uh, but also on uh, stomatolites, reptiles, um, fossils. So the influence of life on the face of the earth, uh, a title that you and Nisbet actually used later on. And he also coined the term that you may have heard of, of gregarious betholiths, these herds of betholiths. And, and really the formative ideas um, are related to, to granite diaparism, uh, were subsequently applied by many, many other workers uh, to explain the, uh, the granite greenstone configurations, including by Karl Anhorser. Uh, so that's all very much fascinating. So in this talk, um, I will cover aspects of, of previous and unpublished uh, geochrome work. Um, I will touch on untangling the stratigraphy, pretty much towards a new professional stratigraphic table, ideas for that. Uh, it was really the title of a talk that Bob Nesbitt presented in 2000 in Manchester. Um, and I also discussed the, the relevance for mineral endowments of the uh, Zimbabwe crater, which I will get to later on. So acknowledgements, obviously, to, to Jim and Mike for their friendship and collaboration over the years. And some of the samples relate to their, to their earlier work. And Bob and Mark for provided the support for this manuscript, getting it written up. Um, Erika Barton for the, uh, the collaborative research on the, uh, on the basement rocks in Eastern Zim, which is yet to be published. So again, that's something that will happen at some stage. Um, the, um, obviously, the Geo Geo Geological Society of Zim for the invitation to present the uh, McGregor Memorial Lecture. Um, John Van, Charles Skinner, and Julie Kong for the support, um, allowing me to spend time on this. And then um, a large number of people, many of whom you will know, Peter Fay, actually wrote about um, Alexander Mears McGregor, uh, Tim Broderick, who's been supplying me with much needed material, Brent, Tony Martin, Forbes, director of the survey now, uh, Huda, Collins, Matawa, and Kasten Musa from Anglo in Zim, really for inputs to and support with the lecture series in, in, in 2019. So really much appreciated. Um, so shown here is the simplified geological map of Zimbabwe, pretty much after Stegman. Um, and it nicely shows in, in, in red and pinkish colors the, uh, the granitoid tenaisis um, of the Zimbabwe craton. And the green stones that you can see here um, in these green, the yellow, and blue colors uh, extending into with black colors in Botswana and uh, into Mozambique. Um, you can see the, uh, the great dike coming through, uh, and you can see the Musangati, uh, the Darwin Dale, you can see the, uh, the Shirukwi, and you can see down here the, uh, the Wetsa um, feeder systems of the, of the great dike. Um, the cradle is bound along its margins by orogenic belts. So you have the, uh, the Limpopo belt here um, in the south, 
uh, pretty much with 2.6 and 2.0 billion year events documented. Uh, we have the, uh, the Zambezi, the Pfungwe, or Pfungsi and, and Zambezi belts in the, uh, in the north. Uh, again, it has Archean components at about 2.6 and obviously Neoproterozoic components. And then there's the, the Magondi belts to the, uh, to the west and then the Mozambique belts pretty much here to the, um, to the east. And each of those orogenies really affected uh, parts of the, uh, of the craton. The western part of the craton is, is covered by, by Karoo um, and, and, and sediments and volcanics. And you can see also uh, like here, and you can see the Kalahari as well on top, Karoo sediments here in the, in the more grayer, gray colors. And also, obviously, in the uh, in the southern part of the country, um, where you have the uh, the volcanics well developed, um, and the sediments to the uh, to the south. Um, there's almost complete coverage of pretty much um, all the greenstone belts um, at one in one hundred thousand scale um, by the geological survey over the uh, over the years. So this is an attempt to rationalize somewhat the stratigraphy. Um, and it really, um, I think over the past two years, um, there have been changes, thanks very much to many inputs from others um, as part of the, the revisions to the, uh, to the manuscript um, to help to make it uh, somewhat simpler and logical perhaps. <laughs> Uh, but it really started on the left with McGregor's tripartite subdivision. You can see there the, uh, the Sabacrian, the Magnesian series actually initially, but then it became Sabacrian. The lower series, Bulawayan, and the upper series, Shamphayan, that then became, from systems, it became groups. At least on the Stegman's map, it's shown both as system and as group. Um, in 1978, um, Martin, Tony Martin actually and Jim uh, divided the Bulawayan group into lower greenstones and upper greenstones, um, basically based on the Manjeri um, unconformity in the bilingual greenstone belt that Tony Martin had worked on at the time. Um, and in broad terms, the, the, the lower greenstones that you see here, they really are confined to the southern, central, and perhaps eastern parts of the, uh, of the country. Um, the, the upper greenstones are much more widespread and, and maybe divided, at least in, in part, uh, into at least two successions, uh, one of which is termed Western and one of which is termed Eastern. And I will get back to this later on. This is important. This was flagged earlier on by other workers, including uh, people like Kent Condi, but it was also already identified by, by Jim Wilson going back to 1978 and 1979. And it's super important. Um, Jim subsequently introduced the, the concept of craton white um, lithostratigraphic uh, correlations. And, and in 1995, in that seminal paper, um, introduced a new nomenclature, which is shown here. It basically goes from L1 to L4 and from U1 to U6. And he also introduced a succession on top of it, HS, Harari sequence, um, and which was novel. It was new, it was um, quite radically different. Um, and each pretty much succession, um, so the lower Bilingrian, the upper Bilingrian, the lower Bulawayan, the upper Bulawayan, was thought to be regionally extensive and, and pretty much unconformity bound. Now, these results presented, um, uh, I suppose, problems with existing ages uh, for the greenstone belts uh, that we had at the time, uh, and especially those in the northern, the western, uh, and also the extensions into Botswana. Um, 
So, and it especially for the for the Harari Shantha belts that I and Mike Finu had worked on at the time, and where we had established a very different uh, chronological evolution, which could not be reconciled, yeah, with the stratigraphy proposed. Um, now, because the studies by, by Wilson et al. and, and the one by um, Mike and I had um, relied on different methods, um, shrimp by, by Jim Wilson um, and Bob Nesbitt and Mark Fenning at the time, and uh, Tim's by myself and Mike Finu and, and colleagues in Amsterdam. So the decision was made to reanalyze all the samples that we had analyzed by Tim's basically using the shrimp instruments that we actually could compare apples and apples. So that was super important. So on the right here, you can see some of the formations that I will talk about, and that also will be discussed in the manuscript, and also pretty much the latest geochrome data we have on some of these formations, um, and also the, post, the, the, the relationships with the, the granitoids um, and the greenstones in terms of timing. So the next map um, shows the, the sample locations of the, uh, of the study that are described in the forthcoming uh, manuscripts. Uh, the, the, um, the squares are the, uh, in, with white are the samples from the original study by, by Jim Wilson in 1995. Um, and the new samples, samples that we, we, um, uh, we reanalyzed, actually the ones or reinterpreted are the ones that have this, this red dot actually shown. And actually I should indicate these ones as well because the interpretations of these two samples here in the Harari belts actually has significantly changed, um, and I will get back to that. So note the, um, uh, so, so basically all the, the new samples, all, all the, the reanalyzed results are pretty much coming from this so-called Western succession that I will talk about more later on. So note the uh, Paleoarchean uh, Tokri segment in the south, but also the possible extents of this so-called Subacro Protocraton that really builds on the work by Clive Stowe and Matthew Horstwood and others. Um, and the Tokwis segment Nices and the infolded greenstones that are beautifully exposed here in portions of the Tokwis segment. Um, they've been intruded by the um, Mushandik granites here and by the Mont d'Or granites here at 3.35 GA. Uh, so that's pretty much nails the, the age in a sense of the stabilization pretty much of this part of the, uh, of the crater. Um, so the Western boundary in a sense of this postulated proto crater corresponds to the division of the, the Western and Eastern successions of greenstones that Jim actually already talked about in, in uh, as far back, I think, as, as in, in the 70s, but also that Kent Conley already actually mentioned earlier on. Uh, but and also did the type one and type type one and type two greenstones that Paul and I described, um, I think in the paper in 2000, 2002. Um, and, and these two successions really show market differences in terms of geospatial extent, as you can see, but also in terms of the little stratigraphies, uh, but also the, the geochemistry as well. And also in terms of the lithological makeup that we see within uh, the, the belts. Um, also shown is the Safi terrain to the south, uh, mentioned actually by, uh, by Kuski, um, and he described, he, he mentioned it, that he was talking about the Sea of Mutali. Um, but that's a different story, uh, but just 
was likely an extension in the sense of the subacra protocraton. So most probably you can extend this boundary line farther to the south, although that obviously needs further study. There are uncertainties, including the, the extensions, in particular west of Shangani here, does this boundary go here, or does it go further to the west? Um, south of Filabusi, where does this portion fit in? Um, probably it sits somewhere here, but it might actually go farther to the west potentially, but we don't have enough data yet. Um, but also, actually, if you look at the eastern portion of the Harari belt here, um, I'm not quite sure where that would sit. Uh, there's an interesting age by Nelly Mutamiri who did a PhD thesis, which has never been published, which actually was, gave an age that was markedly older than was expected for that part of the belt. So that is a different story. Uh, I cannot answer that. Uh, it needs more work. Super interesting. But this remarkable um, Sentinel 832 image uh, by courtesy of Engel and Rutherford. Um, it really captures the, the Tokri segment beautifully. Um, very well visible are these, these bilingual belts here in Berengua, um, but also the, uh, the Filabusi belts farther to the uh, west. You can see the Buchwa belt here. You can see the Mashfingo belt coming nice. Nicely, uh, but also the great dike. You can see here the Shuruqui uh, uh, and the, uh, the Wetsa complexes coming through. Note their location. And also the, uh, the Mashaba Igneous complex coming through here very nicely. You can see the East Dike, you can see the West Dike, Umfimela Dike coming through. And there's obviously the Limpopo belt to the uh, south. Um, the, the stratigraphic upper portions of these belts uh, really marks the eastern succession that I was talking about. And they have been very well described, notably by Tony Martin uh, in the Bilingua belt. Um, and it includes the, what we now know is the 2745 million year reliance formation chromatiites that we see in different parts of this mapped extent. Yeah, so these are chromatiites and they include subjacent sub sills. Um, and they're overlain by a thick pile of pillowed and, bezel, uh, pillowed and massive um, tholeitic basalts uh, of the uh, Zederberg formation, and then in turn by a succession of interbedded shales, um, carbonates and, and, and pebble um, basalt pebble conglomerates in, of the uh, Cheshire Formation. The, these eastern succession greenstones um, are very much reminiscent of, of, of rift type, perhaps, or Red Sea type um, environments. And, and the base is very much um, marked by a very well-preserved unconformity, uh, which is the pretty much national monument basement unconformity here. Um, and then a very distinctive sequence of um, two or older than 2745 million year sediments of the uh, of the Reliance Formation that you sorry of the of the Manjiri Formation that you can see here. There's John Orpen walking there along the unconformity. So to the right here are the uh, are shown some rocks, the amphibolites of the uh, uh, of the Sabakra group, uh, infolded with the, uh, the banded gneisses that you can see here. Uh, also the shelf type um, con conglomerates that you have in the Brooklands formation here, but also in the, in the Buchwa belt to the south that Chris Fado and Ken Erickson have worked on. Um, you can see the Hokonui fence of the lower greenstones pretty much from this portion of the, uh, the Bilingua belt. Um, the Manjiri unconformity is mentioned, some of the, the Spinifex textured chromatiites in this nice image, I think from you and Nisbet. Uh, and then below that, you can see the pillow structures of the Zederberg formation and beautiful stromatolites of the, uh, of the Cheshire formation, which really should be a national monument as well. 
and also lapilli tooths of the Mashfingo belt from here. And these, pillow, these lapilli tooths have inherited 3.5 billion year serpents. Yeah? So that makes sense. In contrast, if we go to the north, um, the Harari Shamfa belt, it really may serve as an example of the, uh, of the Western succession greenstones. And the basal succession here is represented by the, uh, by the Iron Mask formation, which occurs as an arc around and um, structurally overlies the, uh, the Chinamora or Chindamora betholith that Ramsay uh, wrote about, member of, of McGregor's gregarious betholiths. And the iron mask in turn is overlain by, by uh, um, um, pillowed and massive uh, tholeitic basalt that you can see here in green, argolites in brown, and again an, an upper sequence of vulcaniclastic, vulcanic and vulcaniclastic and epiclastic sediments of the of the Passerfort formation. You know, so that's important. That is supposed to be the youngest formation of the belt. And also note the, so we have a number of samples from the Iron Mask Formation too, from the, uh, the Passafort Formation here, also from the Maparu Formation up north here, uh, and then from a number of intrusive stocks within the belt, and also from the Shamfayan there. So both for the Bulawayan, the Shamfayan, and then the intrusive stocks. These intrusive stocks, at least two of them that you see here, Bindura and Masoi, have associated um, gold mineralization. And they show actually the, um, a range of rocks from gabbros to diorites to tonalites, granite diorites, but also granites. So it's very much differentiated. And the rocks on the right here, you can see nice and andesite uh, volcanic breccia here of the, the Thebes formation near the base of the uh, succession in the north. Uh, pillow basalts, uh, rhyolite tooths, um, all from the, the Bulawayan part of the, so the upper greenstone part of the, uh, of the belt. Uh, and then you can see the clastic sediments, um, including here, you can see the conglomerates nicely of the Shamfayan. Very nice, beautifully exposed in many parts of the belt, um, but also cut by porphyries, which is important, basically indicates that um, sedimentation was actually accompanied or to some degrees uh, succeeded by um, porphyry uh, emplacement. Uh, note here with the elephant, elephant shirt that is Kent Combi, and behind him is Ken Eriksson. Um, these are the samples uh, with the, the SIM 92 sets from the original paper by, by Wilson. And then the ones below are the ones that we, we reanalyzed. And really the ones that are shown here in green are the ones that have been, that have been discussed in detail in the paper and also just now and um, have been reinterpreted. These are all, um, geochemically, they're all pretty much, as you can see here, daysite and, 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 and rhyolite, at least the volcanic ones. Um, and you have a number of two andesites here, pretty much with, from the uh, Maliami formation and from the, the Passafort formation. So the, these are actually volcanics that are more intermediate in, uh, in composition, or alkaline. Alk alk um, Interestingly, the older ones, the uh, samples from the, the Hokanui formation and the Kuduvale formation from the Bilingua belt are actually the ones that are probably least evolved um, and perhaps more reduced, which is interesting. So those are two samples from the lower greenstone succession. Um, shown here are unpublished plots for the Wilson et al. paper results. Um, so these, uh, these, these, these plots were not actually included in the manuscript. Um, so they are in the new, in the forthcoming paper. We, we, we have included them. Um, so all the samples actually are presented as is. Um, and you can see here the, the results for the lower greenstones pretty much 
from the Hokonui formation and the Kulu Vale formation from the Bilingua belt. You can see the Arizona uh, formation from the Filibusi belt here. And you can see the El Dorado formation from uh, the Guiru belt here. So pretty much from this portion of, of, the, um, of the Craton. And all these are pretty much constrained yep, at about uh, 2.9 billion years for the, for the Hokonui formation, which is the lower one. And then 2.8 billion years pretty much for the ones surrounding this Shangani Batholith part of the uh, what I would call and what should be included into this buckler protocratal part. For the upper greenstones, uh, so we're really looking now at uh, the upper greenstones of the Bulawayan group as originally defined. Um, these are all from the, the Western succession, so the Maliami formation, pretty much from here, the Avalon formation from the Bulawayo belt here, the surprise formation, indeed the surprise from the Shurukwi belt here, and the Watt shear formation yeah, from the Midlands area again, pretty much here. And these really show that felsic volcanism in these belts is pretty much constrained between 2.7 and 2.68 GA, uh, which is also something that we see in, for instance, the northeastern part of the Shamfa belt with the Maparu formation that I mentioned. Again, that age is pretty much within this ballpark range. These ages also pretty much correspond to the results we have from Botswana, from Steve McCourt and co-workers, Bagai, for instance, work um, that fall within this same time span. So for the Harari Shamfa belt, um, the age of the Maparu formation, as you can see here, is pretty much akin to what uh, we saw just now for the Western succession, it has a nicely defined upper intercept here. Um, but you can see that the, the ages for the iron mask formation and the Passafort formation, they turned out to be an anomalously young. Yeah? And that really turned out to be a point of discussion, some contention, because Mike and I had obtained Tim's results, for instance, for the iron mask formation, which was significantly older than, for instance, the new results from, or, or the results from uh, Wilson with the, uh, the shrimp. So the two analyt analytical methods obviously had differed. So we really decided then to reanalyze the TIM samples using the shrimp to actually be able to compare better what we're looking at. So those results are shown here on the right, in these plots. So you can see that the new age for the iron mask formation now yeah, pretty much corresponds to the original uh, age that we had with the, uh, the TIMS and it confirms the age of extrusion of the first cycle of felsic um, volcanics in the area. And it corresponds also very well with the age for a granite gneiss yeah, of the Chinamora batholith from the outer uh, northern margin of the, uh, of the batholith so that really indicates a short time span pretty much between Vulcanism and Plutonism. Um, the new ages are within error of the Maparu formation, Raya lines. So the ages are 19, 70 million years apart. So there are really three interpretations possible. One is that the samples, the circuits here are metamorphic, but that's not apparent from their morphology or that the sample represents an intrusive fell site, perhaps related to those later stocks that I will talk about just now, which is the preferred interpretation and is also an interpretation suggested by, by Jim Wilson in his 95 paper, or that the iron mask formation, uh, despite apparent continuity around the uh, Chinamora batholith, may be structurally more complex than, than what, we had, what we know, but for that we have really no evidence as yet. Yeah? So that's really um, interesting. So in the Shanghai and supergroup going up, um, and that's really following McGregor's nomenclature. So newly dated, this was a sample that we added, it was, hasn't been dated before. This yielded a, sh a shrimp age of 266 
GA, and it was really similar to the original TIMS age that we had for subvolcanic high-level porphyries that spatially occurred together. Yeah, so those two ages made sense. But then when we reanalyzed that certain population with the, uh, the shrimp of that porphyry, it actually yielded a very complex population, which is discussed more in the, uh, in the paper. Uh, so I'm not going into into detail about that at the moment. Um, at the moment, the interpretation is that the deposition of the felsic uh, volcanic clastic and epiclastic um, sediment and the emplacement of the of the porphyries is pretty much constrained between about 267 and about perhaps 266 GA, uh, which precedes the the intrusion of the the um, uh, the granite diorites of Mazoe and Bindura of those stocks, which is very nicely constrained with the new shrimp dates at 2647 million years. So that's really providing a very nice constrained upper age limit to the time of Shanghai and sedimentation, but also basically signifying the end pretty much of the deformation now of the greenstone belt. Yeah, so that is important. Um, so if we go then, what about this 2643 million year age of the Passiford formation? Because this is really the Passiford formation is really supposed to be the, uh, it's, it's a deformed succession. It's intruded by the, by the Mazoe granodiorite. So that age is problematic. It's an endocyte class from a, a volcanic vent um, and we don't really know what to do with it. So it's a sample collected here, pretty much along Loma Gundi Road. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's problematic because obviously uh, you have the Masoe stock here, which is slightly older, although perhaps within error. Um, so three geological interpretations really are possible and are discussed. One is that the majority of, of zircons, uh, for instance, is perhaps metamorphic, and that these interpreted inherited zircons actually reflect the crystallization age of the sample, which is 2683, and which would make sense with the, uh, the Western succession ages that we see elsewhere in the craton. Um, or that the sample is a, is a volcanic uh, breccia and perhaps related, uh, unrelated to the Passafort, but related to these stocks that we see elsewhere in the belt. Uh, we don't understand the field relations too well as yet, needs further study. Or that the Passafort formation actually is part of the, the Shamphayan, perhaps the younger part of the Shamphayan. And that would really uh, require a completely different um, a reinterpretation of it all. So, what does it all mean for the geodynamic evolution of the uh, of the Zimbabwe craton? Um, the age data for the greenstone belts and and the granites um, analysis of the of the Zimbabwe craton, um, including the uh, magmatic ages, the inheritance ages, the provenance ages, and also the model ages. Um, they've been used to delineate those two markedly different spatial crystal lithospheric domains within the Zim Craton. So you have an older domain, uh, which includes the Tokri segment here and the Sabakra River Nisus, Matthew Horstwood, and, and probably the, uh, the Safi terrain to the, uh, to the south. And it may have extended all the way to the border here with, with Mozambique. And then the younger domain to the, uh, to the west uh, it only shows the, the ages that are older than 2780 million years. And these are all really confined pretty much to the extent as you see here. So work with Erika Barton, actually, we've collected a large number of additional samples from the eastern part of the, uh, of the craton. Uh, and it really indicates that the original Sabakra protocraton, as was defined, really potentially extends all the way east, indeed, to the, to the Mozambique um, border. Uh, it needs, obviously, a lot more 
further work. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the nice basements and the infolded greenstone that you can see here, Monesi, Wetsa and so on, Chifu, I mean, those, those really could be older than previously recognized. So for the later Kian part that is shown here, so really looking at ages that are older than 2780 million year. Um, so these ages obviously are a lot more ubiquitous around the, uh, the western part of the, of the um, to the west of the protocratal. Uh, but you can also see some new ages, like from the surprise formation that I mentioned. And obviously we know from around the uh, Tokri segment from the uh, the work by uh, Martin Prendergast, for instance, on the Reliance Formation. Now we do have uh, 27 to 750 million year ages also coming from this part of the uh, of the Craton as well. Markedly similar ages, as you can see here in um, in Botswana from Steve McCourt and Guy's work uh, from uh, Bulawayo, from the, the Midlands Belt, from uh, the Harari Shamfa belt towards the Makaha belt, even to the uh, to the east. Um, this interpretive map, I'm not quite sure whether I'm happy with it, but nonetheless, <laughs> I had to finish off my manuscript. So, uh, but it's really based actually what the the, the, the greenstone outline that I've shown is really uh, using the the hundred thousand scale maps. So it is an improvement and gradually gets better thanks to the, the great mapping by McGregor and by many other geologists that have contributed over the years. Um, so really stabilization of the, the protocratal likely occurred uh, at about three, 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 50 million years, uh, marked by the emplacement of the, uh, the Montor granite here and the, the Mushandike granite here. So it's really a Paleoarchean part of the, uh, of the kraton. And along the, uh, the Tokri segment margins, like here in the Buchwa belt and the Brooklands formation of the Blingwa belt and going north towards the Shurukwi belt, we see shelf type sort of sedimentation uh, happening between about 3.35 and about 2.95, perhaps, GA. Yeah? Um, so that's Chris Fado and Ken Erickson who really contributed to our understanding there. This nucleus was subsequently uh, Overprinted, was reworked, uh, partly in, in, enlarged, most probably, with the deposition of those lower greenstones um, and the associated plutonism. And really, what, what we see, for instance, in the, uh, the Shangani and the Rhodesdale batholiths to the north, uh, between about 3 billion years, 2.95 billion years, and about 2750, 2780 GA, thereabouts. So that's really the lower greenstones that I was talking about. So most probably many of these greenstones here would either be Subacrian or a certain part of them would be uh, lower greenstones. So pretty much 2.9 or 2.8 GA or so in age. At 2760 billion years thereabouts, um, we see initial extension and, and rifting perhaps happening of the um, the protocratal and really led them to the deposition of the, the eastern succession of greenstones um, marked by the three here, uh, followed by then convergence that started along the, the western margin and the development of a kind of subduction accretion pro system uh, along the western margin of the, um, of the protocratal. So this interpretation is um, uh, of the eastern succession is pretty much unchanged yeah, in terms of the stratigraphy. Uh, it seems to be reminiscent of a, uh, of a kind of a rift type or Red Sea type environment that these greenstones were deposited in. Uh, we have largely coherent stratigraphy. Uh, we have sedimentological and volcanological uh, characteristics uh, that do seem to correspond to that. We have the documented presence of basement cover unconformities um, in the Mashvingo belt, in the Belingo belt, for instance. Um, we also have geochemical and isotope type signature suggesting contamination um, and inputs from Paleoarchean and, and Mesoarchean components, like what we also see, for instance, in the, uh, in the Mashvingo belt in terms of inheritance. 
And also rifting here might have been triggered by the, um, uh, the reliance event, which is well dated by my Martin Prendergast at about 2745 um, million years. Now the age of the, of the Western succession, this Western succession subduction accretion system, it really started at about 2715 million years with the, uh, um, the iron mask formation. And we also have similar type of mechanism happening at time in, the, uh, in Botswana. Um, but really from about 271 GA to about 268 GA, post dating pretty much what we see here, yeah, we have this subduction accretion system kicking in. Now the succession comprised almost 50% intermediate to felsic volcanics and vulcaniclastic rocks, something we don't really see in the belts, at least not in the upper greenstones in this portion of the, uh, of the craton. Um, so we have a high proportion of alkaline rocks, sloping primitive mantle normalized incompatible elements, um, patterns, relatively unevolved um, isotope characteristics, uh, lack of ancestry of inherited circuits uh, in a complex geodynamic setting, very complex, uh, in comparison perhaps to portions, certainly the bilingual belt and the Mashfix, portions of the Mashfingo belt in the, uh, in the south. So this subduction accretion system, um, it was already suggested as early in the this, in this 1970s by Kent Combi, that I showed earlier on, you and Nisbet as well, but also Paul, Paul Dirks and myself, um, and Steve McCourt as well, working on the, uh, on the Botswana part. And the absence of pre three billion year um, model ages probably limits plausible extent of the, uh, the Sabaka protocratum to the uh, to the, to the west. So what does this really mean in terms of the, the metal endowments? You can see here the different uh, deposits, um, commodities uh, with orange showing the gold, green the nickel, blue the VHMS, uh, pinkish the PGEs on the, the Great Dyke. So yeah, the Craton is really host to a uh, number of significant ore deposits. Um, it has the world's second largest chromite resource um, yeah. in the ultramafic sequence of the, uh, of the Great Dyke. It has the world's second largest platinum resource with PGMs towards the upper portion of the ultramafic sequence um, of the Great Dyke, notably in the, uh, in the Darwin Dale, um, the uh, Shropian in the, the Wetsa uh, uh, subchambers. Um, also significant nickel and nickel copper mineralization uh, associated with chromatiate flows and in mafic ultramafic intrusions. And these deposits have really um, yielded over 400,000 tons of contained nickel and over 130,000 tons of contained copper. So that's really pretty significant. And that they really excludes the tonnage from um, Botswana. Um, Interestingly, the polymetallic deposits seem to be confined to the Western succession here, um, which may be significant. Uh, it's an observation, it needs further study. Uh, it's certainly interesting. And then the greenstone belts that surround the, um, the Tokri segments, so like the Bilingo belt and the Mashingo belt, they have really no reported um, nickel uh, concentration. You can also see significant gold um, mineralization hosted by mainly uh, shear zone related, um, uh, so fracture zones, veins, uh, brecciation zones, uh, stockworks, faults, very much described by Pitfield and Campbell. Um, and they're shown with the, the orange squares. Uh, and this historic production really uh, amounted to 2,250 tons of gold, which is really significant. And most of this is associated with the greenstone belt lithologies, obviously. Um, high gold production is found along the margins of this protocraton, where you have, for instance, Kemen Motor, Globe and Phoenix, Resende Group here, also near Gwanda, Blanket and Fubachique. Uh, pretty much all towards that western boundary of the uh, of the protocrate craton. 
In contrast, again, no gold production, significant gold production has been reported from Eastern succession greenstones in the um, Bilingua belt, in the Mashvingo belt, basically. Metamorphic grade was very low, and generally they, they haven't been deformed. Um, uh, yeah. So significantly. So the gold yields, interestingly, of the Western succession greenstones are pretty uh, uh, similar in terms of um, uh, production per square kilometer, if you look at it. And again, described in this paper. And interestingly, the majority of large deposits occur along that margin. So potentially, lithosphere architecture, crystal architecture may have provided mechanical contrasts uh, and strain partitioning, something already alluded to by uh, Pitfield and, uh, and Campbell. So yeah, this work is far from complete. Um, Greenstone belt stratigraphic successions uh, the correlations thereof, um, yeah, it works for very well around individual batholiths. I think the more age dating we will do, the more um, uh, diachroneities we will start to see around individual batholiths, which are probably linked to the felsic volcanics in many ways. So more precise geochron work is obviously needed. So I'm getting towards the end, concluding remarks. Um, so yeah, McGregor's uh, maps really changed the course of geological thinking. His tripartite subdivision is still very valid. His suspicion for mapping and geology is really to be continued. Mapping, mapping is the cornerstone of investigations in our field. Um, there's a clear need for new isotope studies, uh, including terrain chrome mapping, high precision, geochron work, including using bodleite. Um, as shown, there are market differences between the eastern and western successions, which indicates fundamentally different geodynamic environments of deposition. Uh, we see bimodal magmatism and an increased abundance of intermediate and felsic magmatism within the western succession, um, relatively unevolved isotope systematics. Um, so as proposed, we're looking here at the subduction accretion system. And yeah, within the Eastern succession, the geochemical signatures do suggest contamination and inputs from Paleoarchean and Mesoarchean crust, most probably corresponding to a rift type or Red Sea type or some sort of an extensional type setting, which may have been triggered by the Reliance Formation event, as suggested by Martin Prendergast. So yeah, whether there's an association, uh, whether the nickel Copper mineralization is more prevalent in the Western succession, clearly needs further study. Um, we don't have sufficient data really at the stage. And then the emplacement of those juvenile uh, multi-phase plutons and porphyry stocks, super interesting. Um, so like the work done, published on by Campbell and Pitfield and by Mike Finnew, uh, it's now very well constrained with the new age results for the Mazori and the Bindura plutons. Uh, providing a very nice upper age limits to the time span of Shabai and deposition, but also to their uh, deformation. So really, yeah, widespread crystal melting followed and really between 2620 and 2600 um, with the emplacement of the, the magnificent Chilimansi sweet granites that you can see here north of Harare. So really, after which the, uh, the craton then cooled and stabilized and with the emplacement then of the great dike afterwards at about 2575 um, million years. Thank you. Four minutes. Thanks, Hilke. Thanks very much. That's fantastic. Um, and great to see this ongoing work um, being done in Zimbabwe. I, I, I presume there's room to do exactly the same and revisit all our sort of exposures of cryptonic rocks here in, in South Africa as well. Just a quick question or two questions to get the discussion going. That, that the, the picture you've just showed and this timing, is, is that now effectively the end of cratonization, you know, Archean cratonization as, as we'd like to know it? And thereafter we had um, sort of subduction and plate tectonic processes um, proceeding as, as we sort of, you know, talk about plate tectonics in a modern sense. So, so I'd be interested just, you know, what, what, what is the significance 
of this sort of final process of cratinization and, and what followed. And, the, and then just for Andy, Andy, so on the, on the extension of this um, Craton to the west, uh, Arapa and the Arapa cluster, do they sit then in the Zimbabwe Craton, do they? That's my, my tuppence for now. So, so people... Still, uh, I think to kick off, um, uh, John, um, I just, I think, I mean, in terms of when, when play tectonics start, I mean, that's obviously been, um, that's still an ongoing subject. Of yeah, discussion, yeah. So obviously, I mean, whether the uh, the lower greenstones already formed part of a of a of an earlier subduction uh, system, it's very well possible. Um, so, yeah. Um, start my video. Um, there we go. So yeah, so that's really. Um, I think that 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 could go very well back to. The Barberton belt, it really is probably at about three points, already at about 3.2 GA, we were looking at that. And it might very well go back in time. Um, yeah, looking at other um, cratonic settings as well. Um, in terms of the, the, the switching, there was obviously a switch happening. Uh, so we had initial extension happening along the, um, within the craton confines uh, with the, we have the Manjiri formation, which actually could have been a very long-lived um, event, followed by then the, um, the, the extrusion of the, the Reliance formation chromatiites and there are the intrusion of the, the subjacent feeders. And that's really very nicely constrained at about 2745 million year. Although I would like to see, because that's all done by Durkham, I would like to see it confirmed with bodilyite ages. It would really be important to actually get bodily height constraints or more of the mafic volcanism uh, of the greenstones within the uh, the on context. Um, the, the onsets of, of the Western succession, I mean, as far as we know, it started about when the Harare Shamfa belt at about 2715 million year. So that's younger than the Reliance event. Um, it's also younger than, than, than what we see in Botswana. And, um, so it, it, it suggests that you actually had to switch potentially from what we see within the confines of the protocraton to what then actually started along the, the western margin of the, uh, of the protocraton. Yeah. Okay. So off, on, on to Andy. Jutka, can you see the chat? <coughs> the, the, the question uh, no, from I can't. Sebastian. Um, <coughs> Uh, hang on, let me just see. Sebastian, uh, don't you just want to ask the question? Otherwise, I can read it quickly. Question to Hilke from uh, the newer shrimp zircon analysis. Have grains been selected from the same mineral separates that used earlier for destructive TIMS work, or were new samples processed to recover zircon? How no, do you say, explain the offset between the methods? Inheritance do not, not excluded by TIMS. Thank you. Yep, so very good. Yeah. That definitely, thank you. Um, good point. The, the zircon work it was thought was multi grain zircon, so it was looking at zircon fractions. Um, so that obviously you, you basically start to average out your, your zircon populations. Um, so that could be an explanation of why there are in some samples uh, differences. The, um, the shrimp zircons were done on the same uh, separates, um, so they. Yeah, it's it's, it's the, the same sample material that was used. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and just on my side, quickly on your third or second slide, I don't know if you can go back there. I just want to check if it's just maybe a drafting error or if there is another explanation for the. Don't tell me now. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just I think it's just a technicality, but I could be wrong. It's the one unconformity cuts through the supergroup. There, yeah, there. Back to the table. This, there we go. If you look at the the blue line, that unconformity it cuts through the Bulawayo supergroup. Is that is yes. that is that uh, intentional? Um, no, that was really in the ninety in, in the ninety in nineteen ninety. Um, Jim actually revised the succession, and he then recognized a, a lower succession that he termed Bilingian. And he used then the, the Kudu fill marker horizon to separate the Bilingian and the Bulawayan 
succession. So he really okay. split the Bulawai in, into two parts. Okay, thank you. But that has been debated. Um, and I think the division between lower Bulawai and upper Bulawai, and that is very much, or, or lower greenstones and upper greenstones going forward, that is very much valid. I think the uh, the vision of the uh, the Bilingrian is a lot more contentious. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay. Do you want because to the group feel is really it, it, it's it's a local succession, and I think also the subsequent work that Martin Prendergast has done and published on really it has highlighted um, problems with this uh, subdivision. Okay, do you want to drop your screen and then let people open their, their videos so they can see you and we can see what other questions you have or we have for you? Okay. There we go. Great stuff. Okay, Andy. Where's Andy Moore? We lost Hi, him. John. Um, no, um, great talk. Uh, lots of detail. Um, as, as far as uh, Rapa goes, John, um, the the idea is that is now Zimbabwe Craton, although um, th th there's an exposure just to the east of it at a place called Kubu in the south of yeah. uh, Suapan. Yeah. Um, uh, although the um, uh, it, the the, the um, granitic rocks are overthrust, um, you know, by later sediments. So, and and then there's also a lot of basalt covering the area. So, um, so, you know, the geology, and, and then then you've got the Kalahari sand as, as well. So, um, uh, difficult to hit rocks, uh, find rocks to hit in that area. Okay, all right. That answers my question. Um, Morning and Pingo, have you got questions for for our speaker? Anyone else? Brian, you want to unmute yourself and speak? Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank Brian. you, Yuki, for your for your talk. Um, one of the um, the deformation events to be recorded in the Zimbabwe Creation is uh, linked to, to, to the collision of the central zone of the Limpopo region with the southern part of, of the Zimbabwe crater. And this has been constrained at about uh, 2.58 uh, billion years ago. Yeah. And linked to this uh, shortening direction, this uh, north, northwest, south, south is shortening, is we see the development of um, sinistral shears that are compatible with this uh, shortening direction. And also east and uh, southeast uh, conjugate shears that are related to this same uh, deformation event. And this is happening at about 2.58. And this is also uh, synchronizing with the emplacement um, of the crystally derived uh, Chilimanzi suit of granites. And um, these, uh, these conjugate shears have been thought to to probably uh, act as conduits to the emplacement of these uh, spatially extensive uh, granitoids uh, yeah. in the Zimbabwe craton, at least according to Trilow and Blenkinsop in 1995. I was wondering if you could um, comment on the on the feasibility or on the possibility of this uh, of this uh, of this suggestion, and also related to to the space problem that we see related to, to, to the intrusion of these uh, granite rates. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, I think the, at, at, at um, the Chimonsi suite, um, so we also have the Razzi suite in the, uh, in the south that you're talking about. So that was basically worked on by Sianda McQualey and uh, Tom Blenkisop. Um, the timing seems to be 258. It might be slightly older. I would probably expect the age to be closer to 2.6 GA uh, if we get better age constraints. Um, again, much of the dating was done using TIMS in the past. Um, there's a recent paper by um, 
on the endobytes and child kites within the region that are also linked pretty much to that. Um, so I think we're heading for 2.6 H for that. Um, yes, I mean, I think there is definitely something happening at the time we start to see far field stresses linked to the uh, Limpopo belt events. Um, we start to see a, a more north, northwest, perhaps south, southeast directed compressional uh, uh, stress regime and pretty much linked to the, to the movement that you mentioned uh, along those northeast, southwest trending uh, shear zones. So that would be sinistral, yeah. So yes, I think uh, I think what we see there is the exact relationship, I think, between the emplacement of the Mansi granites, whether it was uh, related directly to the Limpopo belt event um, that started or whether it was really almost like a crystal relaxation event that happened after the, the deformation um, within the Kraton uh, confined context. Uh, I think that can be, uh, that is to be debated. Um, I'm not quite sure yet about that, yeah. but, but thanks. Okay, but do you see evidence of this um, shortening direction of this far field stress? In, yes. the, in the northern parts of the Zimbabwe Crater, yes. particularly very the, much so. The yeah. And it's mm -hmm. been it's been published the quite a bit uh, by, by by Paul Dirks, um, looking at the, uh, um, the the orientation of veining that you see in particular in in many of the, the gold deposits. Um, it has been published. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right, and, and just to come in, questions for the guys still working in, in Zimbabwe, Anthony and Brian and others, is, is exploration and um, prospecting and development on the, uh, on the go and quite active? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, yes, indeed it is, yeah. Um, commodity prices are obviously helping. Um, mm. COVID is not helping, uh, but despite COVID, there's, there's a lot of new projects going uh, particularly in the gold sector. Um, platinum is, is booming still. Uh, lithium, you've probably all heard, heard about some of the bigger hard rock lithium projects here now. Uh, and as I say, most recently, some of the, uh, uh, a lot of my, my clients are looking for nickel. Um, so yeah, it, it's very active. And I think as the travel restrictions lift over the next year or two, we're definitely gonna see a, another uh, mineral exploration boom here in Zim. And, and Anthony, with the lithium, where is the lithium hosted? Well, all over is a simple answer, but um, the, the big deposits you may, may have heard about up, up near Arcadia, uh, the Goromanzi just to the um, east of Harari there, that's now, I think, something like, it's in the top five uh, hard rock lithium deposits in the world now. Hmm. Um, and that was an old barrel mine. You know, there are a lot of those sort of old barrel and tin tin uh, deposit or the previously looked at for barrel and tin have fantastic lithium and uh, rare earth elements potential so that's uh, obviously going to be huge going forwards okay and 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 for, excuse my ignorance the actual geology there or the host rock geology they're all pegmatites uh, they're, they're pegmatite yeah, okay. hosted um and uh, there's they're, they're mining spodumene mainly uh, and uh, there's very little uh, processing necessary before export. So um, I think the next big step in the lithium space here is to uh, somebody will start to to put bigger money in and start doing some of the beneficiation in country. Um, and I think once that happens, we'll see a bit of a, a bit of an explosion in uh, in projects as well. Okay, interesting. And, and your sort of environment and to or, or policy in terms of exploration and mining still still very supportive. It is. Uh, we're still running on the uh, you know hundred or century old uh, mining legislation, but uh, the new legislation has been promulgated and uh, it's still in discussion. But uh, we're pretty close now to new legislation here, which. Uh, I think will, will bring people kicking and screaming into the the 21st century. So, I think I think we're on track on that front. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Other questions for me, please. So, Michael. 
And then, uh, those pegmatites that are based around about Kamativi, is there any idea of rebreathing life into those? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Uh, there's, there's a group uh, I'm associated with already looking at that, uh, starting with reprocessing the dumps. The, those Kamativi tin mines uh, have uh, about 40 million tons of, um, of dump material, which, which was never really looked at for, for lithium or rare earth elements. There's a group now who are reprocessing those dumps and extracting, I think it's about 8% spodumene uh, out of those dumps. So you can imagine massive potential there. So yeah, any, uh, any of those um, old Kamativi tin mine uh, and that whole area, highly prospective for lithium. Good. And, and, and we've got we've got two interesting characters here, um, Professor Villun and Erica Barton. I mean, any comments on on you know the green stones and this new work? You you were party to some of it, Erica. Are they still there? Uh, that was a very long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sure you still know all the details, Erica. <laughs> so, so the plus minus has just gotten bigger. <laughs> so I thought they were getting less, Erica. <laughs> uh, yeah, we need to uh, we need to finish that work. <laughs> okay, and John, so, uh, it's Richard. To you, no, yeah, Richard. How are you doing? Nice talk there, Aiki. Interesting stuff. But these age dates become more and more confusing, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, <laughs> not at all. Not at all, Richard. <laughs> can, can I just ask you this, that you mentioning the nickel deposits, um, you've got the, um, the Shangani, Filibusi area, for example, and those yeah. are clearly related to these commoditeite flows or intrusive centers like Shangani itself. Yeah. And then you mentioned the uh, copper nickel in other deposits. Yeah. So you've got the, but those other deposits are clearly not in commodity. Those are in Gabbro related or Associate, more resolved yes. type rocks. Yes. Okay. So that explains yeah. that difference. So, yes. but you can actually use, uh, for example, if you take the Trojan deposit and if you take the, the uh, nickel copper ratio, it's yep. very similar to um, uh, Shangani Damba. So what I'm yeah. saying is that the Trojan, I think, occurs in ultramafix in the iron mask formation. Is that right? No, no, it, 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 it's within the Arcturus formation. That's but, below the iron mask. No, no, it's above. Okay, uh, it's above. Okay, so that is in Kamatiite, though. It is, yeah, in association. Intrusions. Yeah. Okay. And and again, it's this correlation of these uh, these ultramafic rocks that have been used pretty extensively in South Africa now, and there's a very clear pattern that you can use sequences of extrusive ultramafics as generally the very oldest uh, kind of extrusions, and there is a correlation between them. And I just wondered. I didn't really see your evidence. For that in Zimbabwe, each uh, each of these batholiths, like the Chindamora and others, seem to have their unique kind of stratigraphy around them from from your from what you've said. But again, I'm not too clear on that uh, point. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of, I mean, I think um, you see obviously regional differences within the greenstone successions. Um, I think the um, in the south central portion of the uh, of the crate and if you look at the, the Manjiri belt and the um, uh, more towards the, the Mashingo belt perhaps as well, um, Filabusi, um, your um, mineralization your is associated with um, to some degree, your volcanics, but also with the feeders, perhaps. I think whether it's really the, the, the feeders or whether it's more, um, or whether it's the flow channels, I think that's, that's the point of debate. I think there's also been thermal upgrading of deposits. If you look at, especially more towards the, um, the more deformed 
greenstone belt parts, like for instance at Trojan. Um, so those those greenstone belts, the uh, and, and and the and the mineralization there, um, that has been overprinted in a in a um, yeah uh, during as part of the, the, the deformation history that happens. Um, so there has been mobilization of of sulfides associated with that. Um, so I think I mean you obviously have two two events. One is linked to the the two seven four five million year um, magmatism uh, related to the reliance events of, of Martin Prendergast, and one is then related to younger um, mafic ultra mafic magmatism that you see more in, for instance, northeastern Botswana. Um, Towards the uh, the Midlands Belt and then past Trojan, really towards Matsiwa. Okay. At this stage, I mean, it seems that we're starting to get two distinct um, ages, uh, but again, more uh, we need more geochron data. That, that, that's the bottom. So, so there's more work for you, more work for you, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Daiki. <laughs> Okay, and, and, and Mr. van der Spey, are you still in the mood for chasing gold again, or what are you up to these days? You look very quiet and thoughtful there. I'm always very quiet and thoughtful these days, for which a lot of people are very thankful, John. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I still believe that Zimbabwe has, and, and of course I agree with, with Tony Martin, it has fantastic potential, as yet unexplored and certainly un undefined, but the potential is there. And I'm hoping that the, the socio-economic environment will support and be as encouraging as Tony feels it will be. Right, so, you, so you're polishing your field boots. I already polished, John. Okay, good stuff. I have gas in the tanks. I'm talking about the airplane <laughs> or about me. Thanks. Fantastic. Okay, uh, any last questions? I have been on some of these walkabouts, um, in, in, uh, in, particularly in uh, that uh, Lingue Belt area, and I must say I'm always impressed by the in incredible world-breaking character of the minds that have been working in this area. Um, mm. For people like me who look for stones that you can sell, uh, I'm still on a steep learning curve, but I'm very appreciative of the work. I was, I was one of my inspirations back in the 1960s was uh, stumbling over the work of McGregor and the gregarious Bathalist. And um, all I'm seeing is more and more um, evolution of thinking based on extremely challenging, challenging limited data. And I have an enormous admiration for the discipline and the science and the direction new people are taking things. And all I can say is a very, very big thank you. And I think you're doing it for our children and our grandchildren and beyond. A big thanks. Yeah, 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 Peter, you're absolutely right. You have to give credit to the amazing sort of groundwork and, uh, you know, done by those old timers and, and at the time, the detail too, it's amazing. So, so thanks, Tilke, that was excellent and really good to, you know, have the discussion that's followed. Any, any last questions, John Rogers? No, okay, so you, 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 you're sticking to your young rocks. Well, one more. Okay. Brian has another question. Hi, Brian. Yeah, one more thing, Hugh. Uh, from the maps that you're showing with uh, crystallization inverted edges, uh, do those maps show um, some of the currently uh, published edges for the Shirugi Greenstone Belt? Um, there is a recent paper that came out. Um, I think late last year, uh, um, so that it would not have been included, um, but otherwise, yes, it's pretty much up to date. 
Okay, thank you. So I know that's one paper um, that, so those dates I've not yet incorporated. I don't think looking at the data, it has changed anything, um, but in, to, to a great degree, obviously, um, it, it, it added more detail, which is good. Um, but yeah, that, that, that needs to be brought in, yeah. Okay, how can people access the recording? How can people uh, access their the recording? Um, we, we, all of our stuff goes onto YouTube and, uh, and it'll be in the GSSA um, website, um, Brian. But we can also put you, if you'd send us uh, your email address, we'll put you on our mailing list. And then you can pick and choose, you know, future presentations as well. You, you're most welcome just to send us an email if you've got our email. Okay, thank you. Okay. Speaking and of then, which, uh, next week, Graham Gavin will be talking to us about the Greenstones of South Africa and the, the still locked up gold potential that's there. So you're all welcome to take this discussion further next week. Unfortunately, I've got to go, John, if you want to close yeah. off. Yeah. No, well, thanks to everyone and great stuff. Thanks, Ilka, and really enjoyed the discussion and people's inputs. And, and that's really what a lot of this is all about, is actually catching up with old colleagues as well. So thanks, Anthony and others who also contributed and Brian. And yeah, yeah. we look forward to seeing you, you know, most of you or some of you next week again. Thanks, Henny. Thanks for doing yeah. all the hard work and sending out the reminders and so on. Yeah. Cheers, thanks, all. Thanks, thanks, John and, and yeah. Henny. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Ilka. Bye-bye, everybody. Cheers, Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.